welcome to the Rotary Club Milwaukee. I am Club President Darren Miller, President and owner of JM Construction. As we gather in person and virtually today, we'll start by saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, Roy Peterson, President of Concordia University Foundation, will give our invocation. Thank you, President Darren. Many of us here are old enough at this point to remember the turmoil and struggles of the 60s. And for some, the events of recent times are a reminder, a throwback to that. And so we reflect on the words of, of one of our leaders of that time and, and the influence that he had from Martin Luther King Jr. who said simply, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. And for the one who he learned much from, from Mahatma Gandhi, love is the strongest force the world possesses, nonviolence, is the weapon of the strong. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. So I'm extremely glad to be here in person today with all of you. Uh, as I look around at the masks on your faces, it's certainly not business here as usual, uh, but it's a start. Of course, uh, for those who prefer the comfort of home or office, the virtual viewing option will continue on YouTube. Please be patient with us uh, as we transition to this joint in-person and virtual programming. So yesterday, wow, it was a great day uh, out at the uh, Wisconsin Country Club at the RCN Scholarship Golf Classic. Uh, it was a fun time, great weather. Um, as you know, it's a, a challenge to host events uh, today and our golf committee staff um, with the support of exceptional events did an outstanding job. I tip my hat to the golf committee, chairs uh, Chris Corley, Patrick Fenley, and John Ferguson, and to the entire golf committee team. Thank you to all of those who golfed and enjoyed the cocktail reception and auction. It's a beautiful day all around. In the next week or two, we'll be able to tell you how much money we raised. But given the com camaraderie and spirit, I'll declare it a successful event. Thank you for supporting our scholars. Right. Uh, thanks for supporting all the scholars in the uh, RCM scholarship program. Uh, if you drove here today, you'll see that the War Memorial Center has a new parking lot and automated gates. For those of you in the hall today, you'll find a parking validation ticket on your table. When you leave the lot, insert the ticket uh, that you got when you came in, and then the validation ticket to leave the lot. I'm sure that'll uh, take me a few visits to the War Memorial to figure out. Um, the War Memorial is honoring World War II veterans this week by hosting the traveling World War II Memorial Replica out on Fitch Plaza. To enforce social distancing, reservations are required via the War Memorial office. Take a peek as you exit today to check it out. There is uh, an honor roll display out there as well on Veterans Park. For more information, stop by Flitch Plaza on your way out. The RCM Community Trust is a proud sponsor of the inaugural Black Theater Festival. We have a few complimentary, few compl complimentary passes available on a first come, first serve basis. Check this morning's e email or touch base with Michelle if you'd like a pass. And for all of you watching online, apparently there's a problem with the audio and we are working diligently to fix it. So again, to revert back to my earlier comment about being patient, we, we appreciate the patience. Um, I'd like to say thank you again to Frank Kimball for an entertaining snack program last Thursday. Learning about some of his cases over the years was uh, very interesting. Uh, the program is now up on our YouTube channel, so check that out if you missed it. This Thursday, join us on Zoom to learn about Sculpture Milwaukee. 
the installation of sculptures along the Wisconsin Avenue with Mary Lou Kenodi, Chief Curator and Director of Education at Sculpture Milwaukee. If you can't make it live, the program will also be posted to YouTube. If you are joining us on YouTube today, please use the chat to ask your questions. Now, Charlie Evans, Partner and Director of Marietta Investment Partners, will come up and introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Darren. It's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Damian Buckman. Damian is a Wisconsin native, having grown up across Waukesha in Milwaukee counties. A graduate of Brookfield East High School, Damian is an unlikely survivor of a rare childhood cancer. In overcoming struggles with the disease, Damian became a champion of ability, and in that pursuit founded the Ability Center, located on West Wisconsin Avenue in Tosa. He founded the Wisconsin Adaptive Sports Association and the Ramp Up Movement, which, if you aren't familiar, recently delivered on its promise to make Bradford Beach the most accessible beach in the world. I hope you'll, con you'll join me in congratulating him on that in a moment. For his efforts and achievements, Damien has also received deserved recognition. He was a presenter at TEDx UWM. He's a member of the Milwaukee Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Class of 2017. And in 2019, he became a Donald Driver Driven to Achieve Award recipient. A pioneer in the adaptive recreation industry, Damien's vision for the future has transformed a community's recreation. He has a passion for helping people achieve their best and sharing a message of hope through the power of positivity, possibility, passion, and perseverance. In his spare time, Damien enjoys playing competitive wheelchair basketball with the Wisconsin Thunder, a Division II member of the NWBA, that's the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. They're currently ranked third in the country. Damien lives in Wauwatosa with his wife, Bo, and their three sons, Jackson, Harrison, and Lennon. I think they might be Beatles fans, too. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming and congratulating Damien Buckman. Good news is, is I was just told not to speak directly into the mic. I don't like microphones. I often don't stand just behind a podium. I'm usually one who's wandering and moving a little bit. So this will be a little difficult, but there's a certain shot you guys are seeing me from here, and you're hearing the audio from this microphone. Um, thank you, Charlie, for the introduction. And thank you, you guys, for having me as your kind of first live individual to be here and speak. a little bit um, to let me be transparent, um, to allow me uh, some freedom to be vulnerable, um, and a little bit off the cuff, because I had a conversation as we were, you know, just a couple months into this whole COVID scenario with a colleague. Um, some of you might know him, some of you might know his agency, his name is Matt Soberjack with SRH. And we had a chat um, about, you know, what's next, what now, how do we approach, you know, philanthropy, um, how do we approach donors, and um, I have this canned presentation to some degree, nothing in my life is canned, but I will certainly go through a bit and can give. One of the things I said to Matt in that call when we talked was everything is personal now, right? We feel more connected to our communities, to our families to some degree. Uh, got reconnected with you know, old schoolmates, old classmates, old friends, reconnected with family uh, in, a, in, in a new way. 
and, and maybe even greater than we were connected before as we reach out across the interwebs, the Zooms, the FaceTimes, you know, the Facebook messengers, et cetera. And, and, and in that conversation, like I said, I just said to that it's all more personal. And, and I think, to me, the days of this stuff, I can show you the stats, I can tell you how bad, you know, the group that I want to represent and the people that I'm here to serve have it. Um, and that's what we can all do in our different spaces. But um, I think what we do is a little different and is also very timely. So who has taken this liberty during this time to get outside and play more? Maybe it's more golf. Maybe you experienced more of your parks. Uh, maybe you experienced more of your state parks, your local parks, your community parks. And that's really great. But the reality is, is that it is open for those of us who are able-bodied, but it's not open for people with disabilities. It's just simply not. So I can show you statistics all day long about how many people are more obese because of disability, because of lack of opportunity, how much they don't get to recreate or participate. So many people have said to me, well, I don't have people with disabilities that come to my establishment. Well, that's because you're not accessible, right? That's the reality of it. That's because they can't get in, or when they can get in, what can they do? And um, that's what needed to change. Who knows um, where their local park is and can play in it in your community? Who's a better question? Who's a grandparent? Any grandparents in here? Keep your hands up for a second. I want you to drop your hand if your body works today like it did 40 years ago. Wow, everybody drop their hands. Kudos to you guys for still being somewhere in your 20s or teens, maybe, right? If your body still works the same today. What I'm getting at is that we are all borrowing a body today that is not going to work the same tomorrow. How many of you grandparents love to play with your grandchildren? And you're going to want to continue to, always, regardless of your ability, but the environment won't allow you to. The environment that's built today in the parks, at playgrounds, in membership-based facilities and athletic facilities are not inclusive of you to play with them. And I don't think grandparents today are the grandparents of yesterday, the grandparents who sat on the benches and watched from below. I see the grandparents today are the grandparents who want to continue to play with their grandchildren, and you should be able to do that. Does anybody recognize this picture? Have you seen it around town? Because it's been on billboards recently. This is myself and our board member, John Hawks, who has MS. John is a graduate of Whitefish Bay. He was 63 years old. This was the first time he entered Lake Michigan in over 20 years. Maybe some of us have that same story, but probably not because you couldn't get to the water. Probably just because you chose not to. Not John's case. So the Ability Center started this program in this pillar that we call Ramp Up. And it's about making Greater Milwaukee the most universally inclusive recreation destination in the country. And I'm sad to report, genuinely sad to report, that we probably already accomplished that with the few things you're about to see. Because that's the little that it took in order for us to be a more inclusive community. Many of you raise your hand to know about where your park is that you can go play at or the parks that you've gone to. If I'm an individual impacted or a family impacted or with disability, I couldn't have raised my hand because the number is zero. There are zero parks that are accessible and available for people with disabilities. Now, we have some playgrounds in the community that are accessible. That's true. But if you consider the note card in the middle of your table a park and you consider the table a park, what we're doing is putting a playground in the middle of that park and saying, if you have a disability, you can play here. That's it. Forget the rest of this table. It's not for you. We wanted to change that. And so we started in August of 2015 with this ramp up movement. And at that time, we promised that we would build a permanent structure at Bradford Beach. What you're seeing here is actually, believe it or not, the gentleman closest on the screen with his shirt off, his name is Jake Williams. He's one of the world's, literally one of the world's greatest wheelchair basketball players that exists, and he's from right here in Milwaukee. 
struck by a car when he was 16, instantly paralyzed while on his bike. Here, we built the permanent ramp structure down at Bradford Beach to make Bradford Beach maybe not the world's most accessible, but I have no problem putting us on the pedestal and on that mountaintop that says we have the most accessible beach in the country, period. And we laid that challenge and welcomed everybody to go ahead and show us what you have that's more accessible, please. Because if you did, or you want to meet that challenge, or you do have that, that means your community is doing a good job. And if you can't answer that challenge, you have a lot of work to do. So we'll happily pass off that trophy if anyone else can meet it and be the next most accessible beach or most accessible fill in the blank, right? But we also ramped up Red Arrow Park. Now, while Bradford Beach was a $150,000 implementation in its completion, and mind you, that again takes you from not just A to B, which many accessibility opportunities do. You can go from here to there. That's what you get. Well, with the accessible beach chairs we put there, you can, uh, you can access A to Z at Bradford Beach, right? Not just from the top to the water. But we also did this implementation at Red Arrow Park. So for over 20 years, we've had the Pennant National Ice Center, this amazing multi-million dollar over that there's only a few of in the country, right? That no one with a disability could ice skate there. All it took was $5,000 and these accessible ice skating sleds to open the opportunity for everyone to skate. The first people to check out those sleds was a clumsy mom. Think about that. And I think that's awesome. Literally, the park said, hey, if you don't feel safe, we got these cool new things that you could ride and get in if you don't feel safe standing up. And she got to then ice skate with her family and not watch from the outside. That's meaningful because families should play together. Whether the parent has a disability or the child has a disability or a sibling has a disability, they should all be able to recreate and play together. That's an important thing that I'm sure many of our families do, but not every family gets. Oftentimes, the opportunities, which are important that there's some kind of opportunity, but it's an it's a opportunity that says, we're organization A, we're going to welcome you to um, location B on date C, and you're going to use equipment D. And if you can make it next week or next month or next year, whenever we host that, that's great. But if you can't, we'll see you next time. They don't have that same mentality that I can just go check these out when the park is open and go ice skating. In this picture is myself. You heard that I had childhood cancer. What you didn't hear is that I had 23 knee replacements and revision since I was 13 and by all accounts should be a bilateral above knee amputee. And it's surprising to every physician that I see from here to Sloan Kettering Memorial, who actually at Sloan Kettering Memorial when I was 14 years old told my mom to take me home and let me die. Don't put him through more pain than he needs to go through and I'm not gonna be a part of that transaction. But if you come back in six months, we'll do the surgery then. But we knocked on his door six months later and I was there having that surgery when I was 18 years old. But my most recent one was July of 2018, so while I'm a 27-year survivor of my childhood cancer, um, my, my fight never really ends. And one day I know because of the people who are part of my experience in my life, um, and, and I can name them, Shauna and Haley and Rick um, and Matt and Jarvis, all had amputations post-surgery, post-chemotherapy, post-cancer from infection. So it's mind-boggling to all the physicians that I still even have in my legs. And this is important to me as a dad too, right? Because I want to, I don't want to tell my kids we can't skate at Red Arrow Park and I don't want to watch from the sidelines because I shouldn't have to. We should all be able to play together with a family and that's an important thing for our kids. I'll tell you my seven-year-old, or now eight-year-old actually, Jackson, um, he thought that it was just normal to play in a chair. He didn't want to stand up and play stand-up tennis. He wanted to play wheelchair tennis because that's what dad does. 
That's how meaningful that is when our kids can come and play with us. We had the equipment to put them in to play equally with me in a chair together. And that was meaningful to Jack, meaningful enough to him that he didn't even want to stand up. And that's moving. And I think everyone should be able to have that opportunity. This is what we did in Veterans Park. Simple $5,000 application. And now people can rent hand cycles, which again is free actually, at the Real Fun Rental. First time ever that someone who had a lower extremity disability could actually get behind a bike and bike together with everybody instead of just having to go on a ride or experience the lakefront on their own from a bike. You can check out these hand cycles now. That's, um, um, that's Gianni. Gianni goes to Bruce Guadalupe School. Gianni also has a paralyzation injury and cannot ride a typical bike. But now he can ride with his family together. His mom was in tears that day because they can all play together. So you can check out these hand cycles at Veterans Park. And so next, as I told you, there isn't a park that exists for people with disabilities. There are some playgrounds, yes, but what happens when I want to leave the playground? Nothing. What happens if I'm a parent with a disability in a chair and I don't feel safe bringing my kids to the park because I can't chase them should they escape me? Then even that able-bodied child doesn't get an opportunity to go to the park. So at the end of the day, the numbers here is everybody. Everybody is going to have a need for greater opportunity and access in the future. So when your questions ask, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes, something like this is beneficial, beneficial officially to all concerned. Down at Bradford Beach, the map that goes all the way to the water, I will even tell you, makes an economic impact because now people can get to the Tiki Hut, right? That they couldn't before. I've seen single rider unicycles use that mat to go down. I've seen bicycles go down, and instead, because they don't have to move their bike, they can bring it on the beach easily with them. More people are consuming from the Tiki Huts from the dock because they can get down there easily with their equipment. That's an impact that, again, helps everybody. So our next goal is this Wisconsin Avenue Park, this universal park that we want to build. First of its kind, nothing else like this exists in the country. We're working with a company called Game Time to build this concept. It would be a first ever universal baseball field. Yes, there are miracle fields that exist in the country, but there isn't something that exists for everybody that applies it across the board. It's individual, it's a certain set, a certain group. This is for everybody. And it's not just the playground, it's 17 acres of the park is all inclusive from top to bottom, right? And children with disabilities, again, the stats, I mean, we can talk about them all day long. They're two to three times more likely to be bullied. But if they can play together on a playground where they're all welcome and can learn how to play with one another, well, then they understand one another better and they're less likely to be bullied, right? And as you see the office restrooms there, that's actually where the Ability Center, in partnership with the Milwaukee County Parks, has our office, is right inside of this park. And our obesity rates, as people with disabilities, are 48 to 58 percent higher than they already have, uh, um, exist for the general public. And so we need fitness space, right? And I'm going to fly through some of this because, again, this is just not the stuff that's important. I think to me, at the end of the day, what's important and sad is that there isn't an opportunity for families impacted by disability when everyone else has limitless ones throughout our city parks, our county parks, our state parks. People with disabilities don't. And so, again, if they're not being active, what if we gave them trails to be active within the entire park? And how could we drive down those obesity rates, that heart disease, that diabetes, these things that are preventable if we can get people with disabilities active? And again, grandparents love to play with their grandchildren. And grandparents should be able to swing with grandchildren of any ability. And that's the kind of thing that we're bringing alive with this company called Game Time, which is one of the leading manufacturers of playgrounds. And they do inclusivity better than anyone in the country. And we've already pushed them beyond the limits of what they thought was capable in what we're designing in this park and what our goal is in this park. But more importantly, what time do I have to cut off? I'm sorry, because I could talk all day. 
I have 1227. I want to make sure I'm within limit. Anybody have a time of when you win? I'm good all day. Awesome. Let's have some fun, guys. I haven't dropped my pants yet. That's usually part of my gig. So just wait. It might be coming. I don't know how many you feel. Uh, but this is a really good example of a friend that sent me. This is um, Omi and Uncle Andy. And as you can see, one size doesn't fit all. Uncle Andy is on the spectrum. He's in his 30s. He's not the size of a 10-year-old anymore, but he acts like a 10-year-old. He wants to play like a 10-year-old. And I can't imagine a better fitting opportunity and lesson for Omi, his niece, and his other niece, Willow, than to play with Uncle Andy in that mentality and understand just pure joy and love even as you grow as an adult. Because that's who Andy is. Andy will come to our open gyms and we'll host him and just sit in a wheelchair. And he doesn't need the wheelchair, by the way. He just likes it. He likes to sit in the basketball wheelchair and shoot back his baskets. He'll just come by himself. I'll rebound for him and he'll shoot baskets. And he loves it. He loves feeling welcome, wanted, and comfortable and safe. He loves being in the presence of the other people that are there. Even though he may not want to play alongside them, or with them, I should say, he does want to be in their presence. And it's been really fun to just see him come in and play in that way and have that opportunity that he wouldn't have had otherwise. Otherwise, Andy doesn't often get out of the house. Again, this park. I've got these, if anybody's interested, you can take a brochure home, a larger brochure that can give you more of the stats, more of the information, how to get in touch with us. But I just don't think that that's as important as some of these stories. This is when we did Red Arrow Park. That's the Goodman family. The other gentleman that's in this picture was in the picture with me in the back when we were looking at the slides. His name is Drew. Drew also had a, a similar kind of bone cancer to what I had. He had it at eight years old. For the rest of his life, he's going to have a disability. For the rest of his life, it was sudden. It came on. You have cancer. You can't walk the same tomorrow. You're never going to walk the same. You're only going to be able to bike. The doctors still say this. You're only going to be able to walk, bike, and swim and plan on having a desk job because that's all that's going to be available for you. I was at an event just a couple years ago where they said that same crap to those kids and those people that they said to me. And I've been their patient for 30 years. And my doctor leaned over to my wife and said, here's some of that transparency and the freedom just to just rant a little bit. My surgeon and my, my wife work together in Children's Hospital. And they were in a care conference talking about patients and my surgeon leaned over to my wife, and this was 17 late years after I walked out of Children's Hospital as a survivor. And he said, your husband is the reason we try so hard. They try harder for Drew because my, I didn't listen. My mom didn't listen. And now because of that, the ripple effect of all of that is this stuff that, that's happening here in Milwaukee and that we can do better. And so the good news, so Drew is on the left, but the good news uh, um, is Jayla and Leon and JJ. And Nick is dad. Nick brought his own ice skates that day. I bet he never thought he would ice skate with Breon. Breon is the one standing up, but he has limited muscle function. He doesn't have the capacity to skate and stand up on ice skates and the motor function of the barrels to do so. But Nick got to skate his son. Just like anyone else, he can go back when Red Arrow Park is open and he can ice skate with his son. That, to me, is a big deal. Before that day, again, Pettit National Ice Center, we had no opportunities to ice skate. None. This was Bradford Beach when we opened it um, in honor of the 30th anniversary of the ADA. In this picture is Kendrick. Kendrick is 18. Recent graduate of Mount Beer. His mother, Danielle, is in the pink tank top on the left. This is the first time he ever entered Lake Michigan. He has muscular dystrophy, 18 years old. First time he had an opportunity. They have gone back since as a family. This is my teammate, Steve. And this, these are examples to show you that, again, this can happen to any of us at any time on any day. Steve got blown up from a natural gas explosion in his house. Best friend died. He was left paralyzed from the chest down. These are Steve's daughters. And when I think
think about this part, when I think about these things that, that we need to do, I think about Steve. And I think about how Steve should be able to play with his daughters and his daughters should be able to play with him. Because everybody here can. So why shouldn't Steve? And why shouldn't his daughters? Because if we exclude one of them, we exclude all of them. This is me that really moved me recently because I don't see this perspective often. I don't see me from this angle. And as I wear these shorts, I often cover up my own wounds from looking at them with my hands because they're jarring. And when I look at this, you're staring at those 23 knee replacements and revisions or 26. I'm honestly and finally starting to lose count. Um, but you see 30 years of perseverance and determination carved directly into my legs. And I want to be able to play with those three sons that were mentioned earlier. All of whom, by the way, are adopted. Because that's how bad I wanted to be a dad. And I often wear, if I, if I won't drop my pants, at least I'll take my shirt off. Because I wear my message on my chest often. And this is what I want to be. This is the most important thing to me is to be a rad dad. To be a dad that can play with my kids. That's what's the most important thing to me. A dad that doesn't have to tell my kids, sorry, we can't because daddy can't. Or a dad that has to just sit from the sidelines and watch. I don't ever want to be that dad. And I know that it's likely that I'm going to be a bilateral above me amputee, which will put me in a chair, and I don't want to stop playing with my kids. And my kids shouldn't have to stop playing with, with me. And I'm far, as I've shown you, from the only person that has that experience. We are all going to have that experience. I promise you're going to want to keep playing with your grandchildren. And I promise that that playground that's not accessible is not going to get easier to climb. It's going to get harder. But an accessible playground for everybody is always going to be easy to climb. And you'll always get to the top with your kids. And so I looked at this and I was like, this is what everyone else sees. This is what everybody else is staring at. Apparently moving enough for the best Packers wide receiver in history Donald Driver to say to me, send me that shirt. If you can think of somebody who has a higher work ethic, I can't. But this has been my work since I was 13 years old. I'm going to leave kind of a final moment to Tim. Um, he's a recent retiree of 30 years of service with Milwaukee County. Uh, and he really, what he says here made me cry that day. Um, it's honest. It's probably not something I would ever say about myself out loud, um, but I'm going to let Tim have his final word. Something like, this, something like this can't happen without great leadership. And uh, Damien is a little bit more humble than he needs to be. This man is amazing. Um, Damien is, is a special person to me because he's one of the, great, one of the greatest visionaries that I'm aware of. But that's not what makes Damien special. What makes him special is he doesn't come up with an idea and say, here, Milwaukee County, here, Parks Department, make it happen. He rolls up his sleeve, he, uh, he gets to work, and he, and he doesn't give up. That's one thing Damien is not very good at is taking no for an answer. And uh, he has worked on this project for five years and uh, probably harder than anybody else has. And um, it just wouldn't have happened without him. So Damien, I need to thank you for this, but I also need to thank you for all the other opportunities and things you've done in the parks uh, with the other projects. Um, people with disabilities and people with, without disabilities are much better off with you. Damien is a classic example of an individual who cares more about others than he cares about himself. Everything that he does is for somebody else's benefit. And we could use a lot more people like Damien in that attitude in this world. And so I have to say thank you to Damien. Keep up the good work. I'm not sure what's next on the plate, but I'm sure the next project is gonna be big. 
going to benefit a lot of people. It's a very big universal park. Also never been done before. <laughs> As Damien said, it's going to be expensive. <laughs> but you know, you look out here at all these people, they support you. Damien's not a talker, he's a doer. And if you don't get on board with this man, he's going to run you over. And I don't want to get run over by Damien, so uh, let's keep it going, let's keep good things going. If you're interested, we have brochures. You can get involved and be a part of this walk in the park or this universal park project as an philanthropist, as a company, as a Milwaukee better, Milwaukee great project. And we are doing these walk in our parks and our next one is next week, Wednesday, uh, 11.30 to 12.30, right at Wisconsin Avenue Park. Thank you guys so much for your time and your attention. Um, I hope you can join me in, in doing better for Milwaukee and everybody who's in it. Thank you. Is this Q and A time? If anybody, yes, sir. Is your group uh, interactive? My team found we do not. I mean, I, I'm certainly aware of them, know them, and full support of them. Um, but we, we don't do anything together or collectively at this time. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, does our group um, do any work with my team triumph or collaborations? And that, again, answer was, um, we do not. Something completely different, very event-based, um, but a, a fantastic mission. Yes, sir. The question is, do we get any federal or state funding? Not at this time. It's primarily community philanthropy. Question is, what is our timetable for the park project that we're talking about? Uh, our goal is to phase this out, and in the first phase of what's already developed, we're turning them into more inclusion uh, to begin next summer, and then um, like the plans for the trails throughout the rest of the park. Nature in the park is very important to us, right? The first thing the county parks asked us to do was a tree study, so Hoppy Tree Service came in and did that study. And so we know that while we want to put trails in there, what's going to be the best material? Do we know that there's a certain amount of footage around trees that we can't come within it with heavy equipment or we're going to ruin the root system and therefore ruin the tree? So that's going to take longer for us to really discern and determine um, where those play pockets can go, fitness pockets, and where the trail can go. So we expect that to take a little more time, so we'll hopefully begin that construction the following spring or year of 2022. Yes. Likewise. A decade, surviving for 27, almost 30, so it's really started then, yeah. The question is, is how receptive are people to hear the message, right? Am I, am I catching that right? Especially in these moments. Um, I think it's interesting, and everybody wants to believe that we're indestructible. In the beginning, right, as I asked uh, the grandparents in the audience, if your body seem, feels the same today as it did 40 years ago, you'll keep your hand up if it, if it feels different, right? And everybody lowered their hand. It's almost as if no one wants to admit that we are all staring this need down. Um, and I think that the interesting thing to me is that, that it's because psychologically our goals never change, right? One of the reasons I've had 23 or 6 new replacements in revisions is because I played stand-up volleyball for a long time, playing doubles, playing fours, playing... I used to run center for a sport co sports complex in Waukesha for almost 10 years, if anybody knows what that is, and I ran the volleyball leagues. And so there are some nights where I literally played four hours for the night on metal knees, they're not designed to do that. I wore out one of my knees in 18 months before and was back in surgery having the pieces replaced, right? So I didn't need to have all these, but psychologically, mentally, for my health, I wanted to keep playing volleyball, and so I did regardless of the consequences. 
So I think as I start to help people understand that we are all this idea of what we call TABs, or stands for temporal and able body. So again, whether it's disease or accident or simply the aging process, we can't escape the need for more mobility. And I think people are starting to tie to that. I think during this time, I hope you guys heard the message and understood that while the parks are open for the able-bodied public, if you, if you can tie yourself to anything, understand that they're not open, or quote, open for people with disabilities because the opportunities aren't inclusive, because the opportunities aren't there, because everybody will just sit at the bottom of the playground and watch up and not be able to participate. They're not open. That's the reality. And there are some playgrounds that are going to open, but not the whole park. So how long can you really play in that space before you have enough, right? Um, and so I, I hope people are better understanding of it. I will tell you that as people have seen it, so when we were down at the beach, it was a little sad, but also very heartwarming to hear people say, I just never thought about that. But gosh, this makes a lot of sense. I can't believe I never realized that when they can see it in action, when we can put it in concrete as we did at Bradford Beach, people are really starting to connect and understand and get it as they participate in. Because again, if it works for somebody with a disability, it works for everybody. Everybody's using that path because it's easier to bring your strollers or your coolers or your bike or whatever by using that seasonal and permanent path that's down there. Yes. you should ask. Uh, we have always started with the vision of a um, significant fitness and athletic center in universal design for people with disabilities. And the reason for that vision, the ability center as a building, is that we were founded to provide programming, provide some opportunities for people to play, be fit, be active, etc. And we can't find a place to do that. Places are either not accessible, not available, or all of the above. Right, generally not accessible, not available, unaffordable for, for people with disabilities. Um, and even as we started programs before COVID, and we run programs, we've had open gyms with the Jewish Community Center, with the um, YMCA, with Wauwatosa uh, School District in Parks and Rec, right? And just to give an example, Wauwatosa School District has a multitude of facilities and schools, right? We would get one gym once a month for three hours. That's the amount of time you would get. When I was a member of the Milwaukee Metro Milwaukee YMCA, and please understand, they are proud partners of mine, but that doesn't mean we can't look at the reality of the problem because we can't fix it if we don't. Um, when they had all of their facilities, one of them was um, the South, I think, South Suburban YMCA. Of all their facilities, that was the only facility that gave time for people to play wheelchair basketball. One day a week, Thursday mornings, from 10.30 to noon, that's it. You can find open play basketball, open gym and basketball opportunity at all of those Ys at all hours of the day if you're able body. But one facility once a week for an hour and a half, that was it. And so our ultimate goal is to actually execute and build this universal design fitness and athletic center that would be open for everybody. But if you start with universal design, um, then everyone can feel welcome, wanted, and comfortable. Well, the visions never stop, is the reality. <laughs> oh, the question is, are there some beacons of hope in other countries? Yes, yes. Canada has what is called the Ability Center um, in Canada as well. I don't know that when I mean our project. Um, it's primarily funded uh, through their government but it is a 160,000 square foot, I believe, fitness and athletic center that again was designed for everybody to use. Because again, they realize that the major problems with people with disabilities are heart disease, diabetes, obesity. Many of these people, especially obviously in Canada, are in government insurance, but here are on Medicaid or Medicare. And we're, those costs annually are $1,400 higher for people with disabilities at a minimum than they are for the able-bodied public. And that's primarily being paid through governmental dollars. So if we can make that population healthier, we're all saving money. 
right? Mm -hmm. we, those things, our disease, diabetes, and obesity are all preventable, but not when you're not given an opportunity. And you're absolutely right, yes, people with disabilities can go through a door of a YMCA because it is ADA compliant. Right, but and there can be a YMCA, a laugh, a golden gym, or any, any of the fitness clubs. I'm not trying to point out any singular one. Um, but the value for you to be a member isn't there because the number of opportunities are not equal. They're not anywhere near equal. One to 5% of equipment is accessible in a fitness gym for people with disabilities. There are zero adaptive fitness classes for people with disabilities, but the lack still asks me for 100% of my fee. That's like taking a bite of your burger at Cops Custard, after paying for it, they pulled it from your hands and threw it away. Why would I be your customer in that environment if I can't provide value? Yes? That's a great question. Um, actually, coming out of that project, we do actually have an extra 100 feet of mat that we could use at other lakes and other spaces to make them accessible. Those chairs at the beach are gonna be year-round usable, um, meaning that we can bring them to Wisconsin Avenue and they can become ski chairs for and trail chairs with just different adaptations to them so they're multifunctional, not just beach chairs. Um, and so the ramp up movement can go anywhere. So we um, have had calls, actually coming out of Barclay Beach, I got a call from Marco Island. I've gotten calls from Colorado. Um, I've gotten a call from Texas. So we are happy if people want to bring us in to help any community ramp up their opportunities and understand how they can do that. And oftentimes, it really is just in the right adaptive equipment and space that people can use, more, especially with recreation, more than it is building something of significance. Um, and, and that's really what launched Ramp Up when people looked at the different way we handled it. Five years ago, when we put beach chairs at Bradford Beach, it was accessible from A to Z, right? But then there's the reality that some people can't get in the beach chair, and we thought they should still be able to access the, the lakefront, the waterfront, and get all the way down to the water, even if just for a perspective to see it from that, as opposed to the top of the Oak Leaf Trail. And so we wanted to continue that, you know, permanently and all the way down to the water, and so we did. But we can ramp up, can go work with any partner anywhere and help any community be more accessible. I'll give you an example um, briefly of Waukesha. And again, I'm not trying to point fingers, these are realities. They built a very inclusive, accessible playground um, at um, Langley Park K. Frame, that's right, Frame Park in Waukesha. Round of applause, clap my hands, that was really great. But you know what they didn't do? They didn't create an accessible bathroom. So by the way, if you have to go to the bathroom, you can't go here. Thanks for coming to play at our park. You've got your hour now, you gotta go because the bathroom is not accessible for you. So these are the kinds of things that I see communities constantly miss. And you can't then have an equitable opportunity um, if I can't play for the same amount of time or maybe I can't even play at all because I can't bring my child into the space to change them, to care for them, for them to go to the bathroom, or maybe it's not even again my child but myself. So you avoid it instead of actually using it. So there are things that people miss often by not looking at the whole picture. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for your time. And um, attention, I'll have some of these if you want them. Feel free to take the uh, cards at your table to more people if you'd like. Well, Damien, you are a rad dad. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question about that. Um, the work is moving, meaningful, um, and we appreciate you coming here today to speak with us. Um, in honor of leaders like you, Damien, you speak to our club members that we will be making a donation to the YWCA of Southeastern Wisconsin in your name. 
uh, whose mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. A few quick announcements. Uh, tune in this Thursday at noon for our SNAP program on Zoom to hear about Sculpture Milwaukee with Mary Lou Cano. Uh, join us next Tuesday to hear from Rotarian Patricia Hogan, CEO of City Forward Collective. We'll talk about the challenges of reopening schools in Milwaukee across public, charter, and choice school systems. She will be interviewed by our own David Haynes, solution page editor with the Journal Sentinel. As a reminder, if you'd like to attend in person, we need you to RSVP in the Rotary office by 8 a.m. on Friday morning. Please see the link in this morning's email to RSVP for next Tuesday. The Coffee Connector group will be meeting this next Thursday morning, September 10th, at 10, uh, 7.30 a.m. at Catalano Square in the Third Ward. Uh, contact Teresa Rudin for more information. Please also remember to maintain appropriate social distancing throughout. Use both doors and don't uh, congregate in the elevator. Uh, take the stairs if you're able. This meeting, and I'm pretty excited about this, 